Here's what's coming up on episode 152, Michelle Belanger. And the way my mom would play that game for me is she would, you know, lay them out and flip one of the cards over and then take my hand and hold it over that card and tell me, close your eyes, pass your hands over the other ones and tell me which one feels warm. So it's this endless unfolding of, of process and you know, where does psychology start and end and where does psychic experience start and end? And I'm here to tell you that you can't take the psychology out of the psychic. It's the kind of haunting where the ghost tucks you in because you might be chilly. <laughs> I mean, how cool is that? Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the seance. I have wanted to interview Michelle Belanger for years. She is one of the coolest, most unique, and fascinating personalities to follow in the paranormal space. If you are not familiar with Michelle, then after our conversation today, I have no doubt you'll be looking her up. You can find her at her beautiful site, michellebelanger.com. And if you have no idea how to spell that, then the link is in the show notes. Before we jump in, here's what I'm drinking. Wind Dancer Tea. Wind Dancer Tea from Nuwadi Herbals is great for when you need more energy and stamina. It contains, oh boy, be ready for these. This is the one I always mess up. Yerba Mate, Eleuthero, Go-To Cola, Tribulus, Rhodiola, Green Tea, and more. It's got this fresh flavor that for me probably doesn't even need any honey, but I usually do put a little honey in all the teas though. Stay tuned because a little later in the show, I'll share more about new Herbals and how you can get 15% off your order at newwadiherbals.com. Here we go. Time to pour your tea. Michelle, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? I am as fabulous as you can be with funky, gloomy. I mean, funky, gloomy weather around Halloween. There's nothing wrong with that, but it has kind of been cold, rainy, funky, gloomy. Same here. It's nearly freezing rain and it's just a little bit too eh. I'm hoping the kids get uh, trick-or-treating in tomorrow. We're worried about that in Missouri as well. I think it's just a huge you know, chunk of the country that's dealing with that. On the other hand, I'd rather have the rain in cold and dreary than what they were having in Iowa and Wisconsin because it looked like it was snow. Even in Kansas City on the other side of my state was snowing today. I am not ready for snow. (laughs) We skipped right over fall. But uh, the listener should know that this is actually, as we record, I feel very lucky and honored to be talking to Michelle right now because as we record it is all hallows eve eve and she's very busy right now and has so many cool things going on and i'm sure we'll hear about those things but i am super excited to be talking to her i am going to read her bio and then i'm not gonna we're not gonna have any more small talk because i am so pumped to just jump right in Michelle Belanger is most widely recognized for her work on television's paranormal state where she explored abandoned prisons and haunted houses while blindfolded and in high heels. A leading authority on psychic and supernatural topics, her nonfiction research in books like The Dictionary of Demons and The Psychic Vampire Codex has been sourced in television shows, university courses, and numerous publications around the world. She has worked as a media liaison for fringe communities, 
lectured on vampires at colleges around North America, performed with gothic and metal bands, including Knox Arcana, and designed immersive live-action role-playing games for companies such as Wizards of the Coast. Her research on the Watcher Angels led to the creation of a tarot deck and the album Blood of Angels. She has appeared on CNN, a and Fox News, Reels, and the History Channel. Michelle resides near Cleveland, Ohio, with three cats, a few friendly spirits, and a library of more than 5,000 books. So speaking of those 5,000 books, yeah. I'm totally jealous. We've had uh, uh, master's students come out just to do research because a bunch of the stuff is out of print now. That is really cool to be that kind of resource. That, uh, <laughs> I love that. And it's probably a weird question to ask first, but what's the first book that you read on your journey that really connected with you and helped make you who you are today? Oh, wow. There's, there's so many. I mean, I, I, I grew up in a very small town. About the only thing to do was to read. We had a fantastic library. So there was, and I think it was like one of those old Time Life book series. Uh, and it was on parapsychology. And I had access to that God, as early as like maybe 10 or 11. And I would pour through that because it was, it was sort of like a buffet book where there was a chapter on parapsychology and the Zenner cards and there was a chapter on werewolves. And because I remember um, like this weird spell about like wearing a, a werewolf skin or, or a wolf skin belt and make me a werewolf, make me a man eater. And like all, all the Loch Ness Monster, UFOs, just kind of all of it. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd already been having strange experiences as a kid and I was raised, I usually tell people I was raised Catholic, but I think it's important to say that I was raised Irish Catholic because the fairies and second sight and like the black coach and banshee stories, like those were also things that we talked about, stories that I heard from, um, like the, the family back, uh, in Ireland. And so my, my childhood was filled with wonder. That's very cool. I, as someone who did not grow up in this culture, this paranormal world that I am so obsessed with right now, it's it's a fairly recent thing. I get so excited when I hear about people who had resources growing up, you know, in a time before internet and we were Googling everything. Was it a community library, I'm sh assuming, public library? Yeah, and it was haunted. <laughs> and everybody bonus, knew it was haunted. Bonus. I mean, for, for me, like I realized that I grew up in this perfect sweet spot right at the tail end of like all the hippie stuff and free love and like transcendental meditation. And just before the satanic panic, like really set in and like stopped all of that. Uh, and yeah, Hinkley, Ohio, it's a quirky little town. It's, it sort of reads on paper, like something that Stephen King would write a story about. I mean, like, the small town celebrates the return of turkey vultures every year around the Ides of March with pancakes and sausage like you do. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Did you have, I'm assuming you had at least someone in your, your family or circle of friends who was very supportive growing up and helped you along? Yeah, my, well, my mom, um, up till about age five, was in my life and we talked about a lot of things and she was really open to me asking questions, encouraged it, helped actually teach me a whole lot of stuff. Like, so a lot of other kids would get that game of memory where you have like matching cards. And the way my mom would play that game for me is she would, you know, lay them out and flip one of the cards over and then take my hand and hold it over that card and tell me, close your eyes and now pass your hands over the other ones and tell me which one feels warm. And, and so like she was basically giving me psychic training from like the time I was three or four upward. Um, her mother, who, who ended up being the one who raised me after that, uh, she was sort of complicated about it. Like she had experiences herself. She absolutely believed in it. But she also believed that it was safer to talk about behind closed doors. And, and so it, it was sort of like this, this thing that was permitted to talk about at home but it wasn't something to just sort of shout to the hills. And I'm probably going to assume it's not that much different today with a lot of folks. Well, with actually at this point, I'm 
technically I'm an orphan. Like there's, there's like a cousin left and uh, everybody else has passed away. Uh, and not to say that they don't still hang around, but mm-hmm. right. uh, certainly like as I got older, the one thing that uh, I got a little bit of pushback from is, you know how everybody has a different way that they learn things, a different way that they approach information. Me, I read. I, I just have to like dive into like research rabbit holes. And that gives me context for stuff that I'm dealing with for myself and my life and the world. And my grandmother and a couple of other relatives were really leery about some of the occult books that I would read because I wanted to understand every aspect of stuff. And they were somewhat concerned that that was just going to be like taking me down a dark path or, or, or something. And like I said, that started to like kind of get into the whole satanic panic. So it's not like they had a whole lot of good information. You know, all the books were bad, no matter what they were. Uh, I also strongly believe knowledge is power. So th- there's no such thing as, as a bad book or a dangerous book. It's how you approach it and what you do with it. I mean, all of it is based on like, you can have the knowledge. What do you do? How do you act on it? That's interesting. I have also had some loved ones show concern when they see that word occult. Do you think mm-hmm. it's a, is it a, a misunderstanding just basically about the word and, and how part of the word is also cult? And I mean, mm-hmm. that I, I often try to explain that to people. I'm like, well, what, what do you think the occult is, you know, and are you maybe confusing it with other things? Can you talk a little bit about that? I think the majority of people who have an immediate gut reaction to the word occult, they're only hearing cult. The two words don't have anything to do with one another at all, really. Uh, occult, just it's the same root as occluded, so hidden. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's the best word for knowledge that has been shrouded in mystery or hidden or suppressed. And so it's not necessarily bad by itself. I know a lot of people have negative associations. They think hidden for a reason, hidden because it's dark. Uh, a lot of people see occult as synonymous with black magic. And, and that's, that's just not the case. I mean, Technically, everything in the paranormal community, everything a person who is a paranormal investigator researches and and delves into would fall under that blanket of occult. They just don't think of it that way. Absolutely. So I, I there are a couple of you have many books, many books. And a little later on, you can tell us about some of the future stuff that's coming out. And um, I know you are getting ready to release a 10 year uh, anniversary edition of the uh what is it the D- the dictionary of demons yeah i'm super excited about that yeah yeah i i heard that you were working on that the the first book though that i uh got connected with of yours was the ghost hunters survival guide protection techniques for encounters with the paranormal when i found it i was just forming my own paranormal investigation team that i had for uh, three or four years with my family. And I was reading a lot and researching a lot and listening to a lot. And this is about the time I heard you on Jim Harold's paranormal podcast. And I've been obsessed for 10 years since then. And, but I used this book a lot as a resource when I was being reached out to for advice. Um, when I was doing that investigation, in some instances, I've even recommended several homeowners to just buy this book. And I'm like, trust me, it's not weird that I'm giving, cause you know, they're like, but I'm not a paranormal investigator. I'm like, but I think maybe this would be good. It's been 10 years since you wrote it. So I would love to know what do you hear from your readers about this book specifically and how, how do they use it? Pretty much everything you just told me. Um, a lot of teams made it required reading for their teams. Most people were using it uh, to help resolve hauntings. An awful lot of people would, re- would refer it to homeowners. Uh, I would get some of the like, well, but I'm not a ghost hunter, so I don't know. But for me, I, it's, it's my psychic self-defense book. It's my defense against the dark arts book. Uh, but at the time, like the community who really needed to hear how to protect yourself, how to assess the problems, how to keep yourself and others safe were the folks who were getting into the paranormal. Uh, The book absolutely grew out of my work with the paranormal state. And in a lot of ways, it was answering the questions that we encountered over and over and over again with these families who felt like they were under siege, many of whom really had situations that could be resolved just by teaching them 
how better to set boundaries for themselves, how to set boundaries for their families, how to set boundaries around the house. Uh, and like one of the things that I really set out to do with it also was to not make it uh, partisan, I guess, is, is in the sense in ghost hunting, there are folks who go the psychic and the, um, you know, the energy work route, um, belief or religious, um, which sometimes is separate from psychic. And then you've got the folks who are much more into ghost hunting from a sort of material approach. And I didn't want to alienate people who didn't want to like, you know, embrace the psych psychic woo woo. Uh, so a lot of the techniques also are very good psychology. I, I've got a, a degree in comparative religious studies with a concentration in psychology of religion, but that concentration grew out of starting off getting my degree in psychology and then switching last minute to religious studies. Uh, so I, I'm bringing the psychology to bear with it to like help people really understand what's going on. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's really amazing to realize that I wrote a resource that has helped that many people. Yeah. And, it is an amazing resource, just like you said, on many things. But in particular, the book has great information on protection techniques for just anyone. And uh, Jeanette, who is a listener of the podcast, she is a fabulous paranerd. She has a great question. She would like to know if there is any kind of ritual or special steps that you take personally to prepare or ground yourself mentally and or physically before or during researching new topics or locations. And I'll also add, she wants to know, um, what do you believe these steps do for you? And if she wants to know if you can share an experience maybe where you thought it made a big impact. So there's like a six part question for you. <laughs> My most basic technique revolves around breath. And, and this is stuff that my mom was teaching me when I was three and four. Uh, so, so breath as a focus, to me, it's the simplest type of meditation. Like we think of meditation as sitting in the lotus position for three hours and going, oh, uh, and we just don't have time for that. So then we think that we don't have time to focus ourselves. And just three deep mindful breaths help get me focused in myself, help get me focused so I know where my boundaries are, where I end and the rest of the world begins. And that kind of focusing is helpful from just a purely mental standpoint, emotional, as well as energy. Um, so as a psychic person, like kind of pulling myself back into my skin and knowing where my center is, is a really powerful place to start. Um, I also use items, not in the sense that the item itself has power, but that it's kind of a, like a psychological reminder uh, that helps give me a tactile thing I can grab onto of like, okay, I'm focused, I'm, I'm protected. Uh, and I'll totally say that, like, I think that that grew out of playing D and D and <laughs> having a clerical, like you have your holy item and your holy item is like the sign of your faith. And it's the focus that you use. Um, and so like when you're calling on that power, that object, although it's not the power itself gives you something to focus on. Uh, so I have a necklace that you, most people probably seen. It's an ankh with a scarab in it. The two glyphs together mean life is change as kind of my, my personal holy symbol. But it's also my reminder when I'm anywhere that like I am me, I am centered in myself. Um, life is change. I can change in order to adapt to this situation. Most recently, um, and this is a fun anecdote, um, I've been working with Jack Osborne and Katrina Weidman on portals to hell. And in season one, there was an investigation we did at Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum that the level of detail I got on the psychic walkthrough, it kind of rocked me. Like I, and maybe that's going to sound weird to people who, who, who are like, but you're a psychic and, and you know, we, we can tell that you're accurate with stuff. But let me preface that with one, I never assume I'm going to be right. I, I think it's important going into readings, especially with no expectation for either success or failure to just be in the moment, which is where the breathing and the meditation really help. If you caught that episode, uh, there, there was a particularly brutal murder in that asylum in the 80s. And I'd been getting led around the, the building blindfolded for I don't know how long. It was like one of the last places that they pulled me into. And I will be honest, like if I were to be a viewer watching this reading on TV, 
it would stretch my credibility. I, I would really think that that level of detail had been like front loaded, that the person had either um, researched it ahead of time. So stepping back from that, like I'm always assessing those readings, uh, the walkthroughs from the perspective of how am I doing it? How can I do it better? Uh, am I actually reading the space and the spirits or am I accidentally reading the people who are standing around me? And with Trans Allegheny, that was a concern because when I finally watched the episode, many of the points that I hit in that room and in a couple of other places were things that they had been told on the tour. Now, I'm never going to like be able to split that hair and go, am I psychically reading the living people or am I psychically reading the room? And I know that, you know, most people are going to be like, it's psychic any, any which way, but, but for me, it's important. So I have crafted another item that I have started to use prior to specifically the walkthroughs because I want to focus on the dead first, not on the living. And I do a lot to like block off, like, this is what Jack feels like. This is what Katrina feels like. I'm trying not to read their thoughts as we walk through a place. But it's, it's sort of like a little rosary. You'd probably call it a mala. And it's just like uh, four sets of six beads. They're carved out of bone. They're little skulls. And I just kind of hang on to them as a, as a touchstone to remind myself that where my focus needs to be first is with the dead because that's whose story I'm trying to tell. And the two walkthroughs I've done with Jack and Katrina after Trans Allegheny have been another level of accurate that like when it's all said and done, we sort of sit around looking at one another going, huh, well, that, that's, huh. <laughs> and, and again, I know that people see me as a psychic and you know, have, have seen me do it over and over again. I've been doing that work for what, 20 years now. And it probably is going to sound either falsely humble or, or something strange, I guess, to say that I don't assume I'm going to be right, uh, that I still am surprised when I get that much information. But, but the items, it's important to know the item itself is not the power. It's just the tool that helps you focus your own abilities. But items can be really helpful for that. Anyway, so, so that's... That's my story. No, I love that. When you were blindfolded, did you already know that you were at Trans Allegheny? In, in that case, yes. I've tried to set even stricter uh, rules where they don't even tell me where I'm going. Mm -hmm. And with Trans Allegheny, see, the problem is, is they have to be able to ask me, have you been here before? <laughs> yeah. Which <laughs> usually means that they have to tell me at least where I'm going. Uh, the first one we did this season, uh, second season, I just knew that I was going somewhere, like I had an address that I was driving to in, in Ohio, didn't have anything else. So that was handy. Um, because it was, you know, they say you're going to an asylum, you're going to this, like, there's so much that you can kind of assume from that point. Right. But at this point, I usually have them put the blindfold on uh, at the hotel, um, and then drive me to the location blindfolded. We've started having me try to start doing the reading while I'm en route to see like how far away do I start picking stuff up that's relevant to the location. And that's been interesting too. Um, the most bizarre thing I picked up at Trans Allegheny that wasn't a, a brutal, horrible murder was a very vivid image of what turned out to be one of the old doctor's cars, which strangely is on display in the building, which got some squealing from me when I like turned <laughs> turned a corner to go to the bathroom, like that car, that car. <laughs> um, as of the first episode I filmed for second season this year, um, I'm probably going to ask them to have some paper handy. Uh, I am not, my mom was the artist. I'm not an artist, but I can do some rude sketches. And that particular one, I think will have a much greater impact because I was able to draw a person I was seeing and I hit enough key images of like what that person looked like that you could hold a photo of, uh, of this person up to what I'd sketched out and kind of like go and, and there's the hair and there's the glasses and there's, mm -hmm. and just that, that was, that was pretty cool. Um, if I do say so myself. It sounds to me like these experiences that you're, you're having in the filming and it sounds like it's, it's a great way to keep you still learning and growing like uh, abilities and 
and knowledge. And it, it sounds like school, kind of. For me, there is at least a thread of self-interest in agreeing to do the walkthroughs because it's the best learning system. Um, it's very difficult to do this stuff in like a strict laboratory environment. And like the best way I can put the abilities to the test, try to understand how they work, like really immerse myself in the experience and then get immediate confirmation or denial is to go out to places like Trans Allegheny or Eastern State Penitentiary or ideally places that are even more obscure, um, that the story isn't really well known. So I can just drop myself in and test it. Uh, it's, it's like a final exam every time. Every single time I do it, it teaches me more about how the abilities work, how my particular abilities tend to speak to me. I most recently, so I'm, I'm a pop culture junkie. I'm a big nerd, like, you know, Star Wars and Star Trek and Asimov and high fantasy and Tolkien. And like, if if it is, if it is geeky, I'm probably into it, which means that my brain is also like this never ending stream of pop culture references which I used to think were completely irrelevant and just a part of like me getting distracted when I was doing a walkthrough until the past couple of times I've had like a a sudden scene from a movie pop into my head and I would have discounted it, but it ended up being the sort of like the, the leap off point to this room reminds me of a scene that I saw and that scene has useful information for what is here it, basically learning that pop culture references are also part of my internal language, uh, and that like every piece of information that's going through my mind when I'm blindfolded and focused on these spaces, everything's relevant. It's just trying to figure out what it's telling me. So it's this endless unfolding of of process, and you know where does psychology start and end, and where does psychic experience start and end? And I'm here to tell you that you can't take the psychology out of the psychic. You're listening to the Big Seance Podcast with Patrick Keller. Be sure to check out BigSeance.com for more discussion. This episode of the Big Seance Podcast has been sponsored by Nuwadi Herbals, a family-owned business operated in the St. Louis, Missouri area since 2002. The Cherokee people have a word for universal energy. That word is Nuwadi. Rod Jackson is the founder of Nuwadi and has personally developed their products from recipes influenced by his Cherokee ancestors. The Nuwadi line consists of natural herbal products designed to actually do something. They promote healing, healthy skin, relaxation, and energy. They produce four lead product lines, herbal teas, herbal bath salts and scrubs, herbal bath bags, and herbal balms and body oils. They also have soaps, natural insect repellent, and a line of pet products. Nuwadi has been featured at numerous red carpet events at the Grammy Awards, the Teen Choice Awards, the Oscars, the Emmys, and the Screen Actors Guild Annual Health Fair. Visit NuwadiHerbals.com and use code BIGSEANCE, all one word, to receive 15% off your Nuwadi Herbals order as a thank you. Again, that's NuwadiHerbals.com. And Nuwadi is N-U-W-A-T-I. Thanks for joining us for the Big Seance Podcast. We'd better get back to the table while there's still some candlelight left. Well, I had to tell you, speaking of psychic and psychology and all that, the other, um, I've read several of your books, but the other book that really kind of blew me away was Psychic Dreamwalking. And... Mm. I, in the middle of reading this book, I remember contacting you to let you know this story. I was blogging a lot in those days and I wanted <laughs> I wanted to read you just a brief portion of the blog post. So this is a dream that I had while I was in the middle of reading your book. So uh, it says, no one will ever believe this, but I've been hanging out with Lady Gaga. She moved in down the street. Oh, she's not the Lady Gaga you're used to seeing. She's here for the peace and quiet during her downtime, so she wears the typical A-lister disguises. It doesn't take much, though, really, because without all the makeup and costumes meant to shock, she doesn't look much like her character at all. She almost fits in. 
Yesterday, we took a long walk. That's the part that cracks me up. Dream walking, walking cracks me up. That would be my brain right there to literally do that. <laughs> Yesterday, we took a long walk through the neighborhood, acted goofy, took selfies. And I find out that we've actually been Facebook friends for a few years now, but I never knew since she goes by another name on social media. How crazy and random is that? Today, she's back at it, though, and she texted me a photo of herself backstage in a crazy costume, business as usual, just before it was time to greet her massive, screaming audience. And at the end of my blog post, I said, what was I reading before bed? Oh, yeah. Psychic Dreamwalking by Michelle Belanger. (laughs) Does that book throw people in another world often? Yes. My favorite story about psychic dream walking and the impact it had on someone was, you know, how I'm always, so, so first of all, let me say what psychic dream walking is. It's sort of where out of body experience and lucid dreaming intersect. So it's a little bit like astral projection, but instead of sending yourself out, you go in first and use the pathways of dream to reach out and communicate with people. Uh, because it's a type of contact, because it can be very intimate um, and you know even startling and jarring, I encourage that if people are learning how to do it from, from the lessons in the book, that they find a willing partner to do it with. Well, there was, there was a gal who, she didn't have anybody that she could say, hey, I'd like to do dreamwalking exper- experiments with you. Uh, I guess she was in a fairly conservative area. And she made the conclusion that since I'd written the book, it would be okay to try to reach me. Which, okay, I mean, I I can see it. So (laughs) I get this somewhat apologetic email, which actually contains a huge amount of affirmation for me about something, validation about something. So she'd been trying to dreamwalk to me and she's like sending herself off to my dreamwalking chamber. And like, she keeps getting stopped by this big guy who looks like he's like an old Celtic warrior, like oiled leather armor and everything, uh, long hair, a certain look to him. And he, he just like, basically like, you shall not pass and like sends her off on her way. And over and over and over again, and she's convinced that he is just the projection of her fear of failure and like her, her worry that she's not good enough and she can't do this. And somewhere along the line in all of these experiments, she realizes that this is a guardian of mine that is actually guarding my room and kicking her out so that I can sleep. (laughs) And at the time, I had not talked about this guy. Um, But I I have a number of, I'm not going to call them spirit guides because they're really more like like buddies and good friends on the other side. And Kimrick, uh, the the nickname just means the Welshman, uh, because he was the Welsh guy with a bunch of other Irish guys. Kimrick had showed up and like almost as soon as I wrote the book and it was published, he showed up and he wouldn't leave my side. I'd go to my room and I'm like, why are you standing by my bed? And uh, there was one time where he's like, well, if you really want me to go away, you can see what happens. And there was this, this, just this sense of a bunch of people kind of like trying to like yank on the space. And I was like, okay, cool. Stand by my bed, do whatever you're doing. I like to sleep. (laughs) But she saw Kim Rick. And he'd been pretty much just playing psychic goalie for me, (laughs) keeping all of the random people out so that I could sleep. And and like that level of, I don't know, dreams are such an undiscovered country and and so intricately woven with all of our psychic abilities, the paranormal, uh, creativity. And there's such a profoundly deep well. And in that book, it's... It's not for everyone. I don't think that it gets quite as much exposure as maybe it could. Uh, but everybody who manages to read it really ends up taking a lot out of it. Also, because of that book, I'm married. <laughs> Bonus. <laughs> yeah, no, there was Psychic Dream Walking, I think, was one of the first ones in my books that my wife, Illyria, read. And she read it and she's like, I love this person's brain. I need to meet this person. Oh, that is awesome. Oh, my gosh. Check this book out, people. Uh- You, I was fascinated with the concept of dream haven, Mm -hmm. and I think you've kind of hit on this and that I think maybe is the, especially if you agree with someone who would like to, you know, meet in a space in a dream, Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that I'm trying to remember, I think that's what it is. And I can still picture mine because you had really great ways of helping you to design your own personal dream haven where you have a connection and it's very personal and I can still picture it. 
when it's, it's a useful thing to create when you're doing meditation, when you're doing any kind of interior work to have a, a good solid place where imaginatively you can retreat. It's a very powerful tool, whether you're doing dream work or anything else. I really, really, really want to talk about Inspiration House. And I know it's it's a place really close to your heart. And yeah. I just recently watched a Facebook Live video that you had where I felt incredibly lucky that I just happened to be tuning in because I got a tour on your Facebook Live video of Inspiration House. And so tell us, tell just tell us all about it. Just run with it. So for the past couple of years, I'd been looking for a place that I'd be able to run classes out of. And especially because Psychic Dreamwalking is one of my books. Ideally, I wanted a place where people could sleep over and we could do like weekend retreats and work with dream work and dream recall and things like that. So that pretty much meant that I was looking for a home, a house. And I also wanted something that was that was fairly old. Like I was looking at old Victorians where I live. There's a lot of old Victorians. So like houses that had been built in like the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. And that's a big investment. Uh, and it had to be exactly, exactly right. And the stars needed to align. Uh, we'd gone... Uh, I run an event every year called the House Camp Brew Gather. And we had recently moved to Oberlin, Ohio, uh, because they've got this fantastic hotel. That got my eyes on Oberlin, which is this incredibly open-minded, artistic, welcoming um, small town in the middle of fairly rural Ohio. It's got one of the oldest music conservatories. Uh, the, the college and the town were built uh, and established in like 1833. All kinds of cool history. And I ended up looking at this big old Victorian that wasn't quite right. But because we put in some information in Zillow, this brick house popped up. And I remember looking at Elyria and going, eh, what the heck? Let's go check it out. And when I walked through the door, and I know that this is going to sound like corny, but like I walked through the door and I knew that this was the one that I wanted. This was the one that I needed. And it wasn't exactly what I had pictured. Uh, again, I hadn't thought about brick. This was more Italian. It wasn't um, a Victorian. It was a little older. It had been built in like 1869, 1870. But something about the house just spoke to me. The realtors, um, uh, a mother and daughter team, were, I'm not going to say dodgy. They weren't dodgy. They were actually very open about stuff, but they were choosing their words carefully. The house had been empty for over a year. The people who had lived there, um, they had gotten married, they bought the house, and they pretty much settled in to make it their dream house. And for some reason, it did not work out for them. And the house told an interesting tale. Like there were still clothes in the laundry hamper upstairs. Like it looked like at least one of them had just packed an overnight bag and left, never to return. The realtors said words like, well, the house does have a certain energy. And well, it it might not be for everyone, but you two seem like you can handle yourselves. (laughs) (laughs) And so I kind of left Illyria, who's much, very cheery, very chipper, uh, very disarmingly sweet to talk to the the realtors while I wandered off by myself to just try to talk to the house. And it felt like there were several intelligent spirits just kind of poking around in the periphery and checking me out as I was checking them out. And uh, that first time, it was still a little bit out of our price range, but then it dropped and it dropped again. And we were like, well, let's put in a bid. Uh, We did not put in the the highest bid, but kind of reading between the lines, we offered the owner, um, owners, that they could just leave anything. If they didn't want to ever set foot back in the house, that was fine. We would take care of it. We would clean it. We, We didn't care. And they jumped at that opportunity. So we got a charmingly haunted house, which at first was actually, there was a lot of ick left over from, I mean, let me, let me tell you that the two people who owned the house before us, if there was something that could have gone wrong in their lives, it did. And it left a mark. And for two weeks or so, like in cleaning the house, we were also cleaning just sort of the aftermath of some very terrible experiences. And I was trying at that time to assess, was that a house or was it just them? Um, had something, had, had these things happened because of the house, because of something dark with the haunting? And as I got to know Inspiration House and the people who were there, the, the dead roommates, 
it was really clear that it was just those two, that couple, like bad circumstances, bad situation. And the ghostly residents were actually as relieved to have them gone <laughs> as anything. Um, I had a peculiar experience, I mean, maybe not peculiar for me, of, of one of them, a, a gentleman. I, I later found his name. Um, I learned that his name is probably Charles Ken Du Bois. Um, not Du Bois, but Du Bois. That's how he pronounced it. He was following me around and telling me how to paint the rooms. He was very clear. Um, he had so many opinions about the drapery and the color scheme, and he had a very well-developed sense of the color palette. As I did research on him, um, I found that he was a fellow who worked in art history. He was a restorer of artworks. He liked rug weaving. He was very artsy himself and had lived there for something in the neighborhood of 20 years. Because it's a small town, I got this awesome opportunity of the fellow who owned the antique shop we bought some of our stuff from happened to have also been the handyman for Ken Du Bois. So when he delivered some of the stuff, he's like, I know this house. And so he was full of all these stories uh, and was able to confirm a lot of what I was picking up on that particular fellow. Uh, folks in that area are super into genealogy. So I have like this 20 page booklet at this point of like all of the people who lived there, there have been multiple deaths in the house, which sounds scary at first, but when you realize that there are people who lived their entire life in the house, they loved it so much, they lived until they couldn't live any longer, and they stayed even after that. So there's the widow Ackleson and her brother James McRoberts Worcester, who um, was blinded by a horse's tail in a freak farming accident. <laughs> and, like There's so many stories that this house has to tell. And it's just become... First of all, the most charming haunting I've, I've ever really had a chance to be part of. But for all of that, one of the most physically active in a way that I'm not accustomed to seeing unless it's really scary and negative. It's just something about this house. It's you hear footsteps, doors open. I have personally witnessed a doorknob to the basement rattle, like, like something, somebody trying to like, like, like Hollywood horror movie stuff. Only I could tell it's like, this is just, this is just somebody trying to move the door. And my favorite, which is music boxes. Uh, there was a Fisher Price toy that you probably had when you were a kid. I had when I was a kid. It's a little fake TV and it like has a little image that like scrolls and it plays row, row, row your boat uh -huh. and um, uh, London Bridge. We're pretty sure that the previous owners got it at a yard sale. And it was, as we were cleaning the house, went on the pile of we were probably going to donate it or throw it out because it was pretty grungy. And it just started to play in ways that were impossible not to assume a certain level of intelligence. You know, at first I'm like, okay, we're, we're just shaking the floor. It's broken just the right way. I mean, at this point, I, I can't debunk it. Um, it will play a few notes pretty much to greet me almost every time I come over there. And the more you talk about the residents in this house, the more likely it is to, it sits in the display room to just randomly play four or five bars or just give you an entire rendition of row, row, row your boat. <laughs> and it's just, like I said, like a level of cozy haunting. We uh, have been running it up through Airbnb in between stuff as we're doing renovations. And not everybody is there because it's a haunted house. Fortunately, several of the people who have had experiences who didn't expect ghosts, were cool about it. And my favorite one was uh, a gal who was out uh, at the end of summer last year for, she was doing some art thing in Oberlin. And she'd fallen asleep on the, on the parlor couch and she'd opened all the windows. And it was that time of year where it had been really warm in the day, but then it dropped really cold. And she woke up and she was alone in the house. And someone had tucked a blanket around her and closed all the windows, which resulted in a very curious, text via Airbnb. <laughs> um, she wasn't scared so much as she was like, so I'm not sure how to start this conversation, but I think your house is haunted and I'd like to talk about it on my blog. Here's what happened. <laughs> but it's a kind of haunting where the ghost tucks you in because you might be chilly. <laughs> I mean, how cool is that? It feels like you've kind of helped to make it a happy place too. Like you are very much a part of helping to make their experience in their, you know, home. And I'm talking about the spirits here, a happy place. And so it's probably a two way kind of appreciation. 
one of the things that I always regret when I'm doing stuff on the television shows is we get a day to three days maximum at any location. And sometimes that's not enough time to really get to know everybody who's there, the different layers and the nature of the haunting. And buying a house that I suspected was haunted gave me the time to get to know the space and the, the town and the feel and like all of the layers of, of the haunting. And like it, it still has things that surprise me and like interesting coincidences, um, synchronous connections with people that I either met or like knew from a long time ago. Uh, one, one of the weird things was finding that uh, a longtime friend of mine actually had worked with one of the previous owners and we were none the wiser when we bought the house. So it's, it's this constant unfolding of all of these people's stories. And, you know, most of those stories are charming and their relationship with the house had been a positive one. Like they built their families, they built their lives there. And I get to sort of be a, a part of that and, you know, hear their stories and kind of continue making it a home and a cozy place and a place where more stories get get made and written. And it's really beautiful that in a way you've kind of made it a museum mm -hmm. because you have artifacts that you have saved and displayed. I remember seeing on that video and that's very cool and very respectful and, and, and just awesome. I'm jealous that you have this, this place. And I'm sure there are many listeners that are jealous too. It It's, a huge, wonderful opportunity. Everything aligned perfectly. I mean, it's not been cheap to do the renovations and stuff on it. Like there were things that needed to be fixed. The display room sort of happened naturally. There was when the house was first built and there's like the front part of it was built in like 1869, 1870. And then the back half was an addition built in 1909. That, that front half had like what looks like an addition itself, but as far as we can tell, it was built at the same time. And it's just this little room that we think was used, actually we know, was used as an office frequently um, for the people who lived there. From a former mayor of Oberlin who used it as his office when he was justice of the peace to a fellow who dealt in coal and ice and used it as like his merchant headquarters. And that room became very naturally like the display room. Like when I first was going through the house, like I, that, that was one of the things where like I wanted to have like a little mini library and a place where not just haunted items reside, but items that help us understand the paranormal and our relationship with it better. Uh, and, and at first I was like, well, but do I have enough stuff? And then I realized that things that have become normal for me are not normal to everybody else. So. I've got my mother's haunted violin in there. I've got a couple of keepsakes from my paranormal state days. Uh, there's a fair number of haunted dolls that I got largely because I didn't think that they were things that should be at thrift stores where somebody who didn't expect to get a haunted doll should probably be picking up a haunted doll and taking it home. Uh, and I originally started with those to kind of keep the whatever is attached to that Fisher Price toy company. Uh, couple of more music boxes, which also reliably play now. And I don't know, just one of the other aspects of the display room is by kind of giving a focus for haunted things. It sets a whole room in the house aside uh, to help honor the spirits that are there and to give them a bit of the space that is their own. And in that way, like it's I don't know, it's sharing a little bit of the house with them. And I think adds to having a good and positive relationship with them. I'm sure you know this, but first of all, people like you because you're cool, obviously. Duh. I think one thing that draws people to you is your uniqueness. You are mm -hmm. so very unique and there is not another Michelle Belanger out there. And I've heard you, you know, in your bio, you, you mentioned... Uh, representing fringe communities. And I saw in that same live video, actually, that you were talking about some neighbors and experiences that you've mm -hmm. had with uh, bigotry, um, you know, closed mindedness and judgment based on you being different in your uniqueness. And I know that a lot of your followers 
they like that about you probably because it represents a part of them. And Mm -hmm. so I would love if, and this seems so random now at the end of this interview, but I would love for you to share maybe wisdom that you have for young people or anybody actually who are different. I have a lot of wisdom for young people who are different. (laughs) I mean, the first thing is, is don't let other people's judgments make you judge yourself. The second thing, and actually this is more important, don't measure yourself by anybody but yourself. Like that's the only person you ever need to compete with. And that's the only person you ever need to measure up to. Uh, And that means that you need to understand who you are and what is valuable to you and what you really want to do with your life outside of what people tell you you should be and how you should be. We, we, we live in a society where like every, everything gives us some pressure of being somebody that somebody else expects us to be, from parents to pastors to teachers to the town you grew up in. But at the end of the day, the person who has to live with you is you. So I know that it can be scary and challenging. I know that, I know from personal experience that there are times where you cannot be out and loud and proud because it's dangerous to do so. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't know who you are and at least have the courage to tell yourself in your sacred, secret place, this is me. This is who I want to be. Here's how I think I need to change the world so that I can live in it as authentically as possible. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. That was beautiful. Uh, That was one of the first things I knew I wanted to ask you. (laughs) I just had to get through all the paranormal stuff first, you know? (laughs) Well, I want people to know that your website has a wealth of knowledge and they'll find that in the show notes. There's a, a big corner of that website that talks about Inspiration House and events and classes and retreats and photos. I loved seeing the, the uh, Airbnb photos of the rooms. They're beautiful. Wish I lived closer. And also there's, I mean, you have so many books again, there's books and it's just a beautiful website. And so do make sure that you check What's your website? Tell us your website real quick. My first and last name, Michelle Belanger.com. And if you're not sure how to pronounce that, Alanger, think Bell Anger. <laughs> With one L. I sometimes try to put two L's. Yeah. It's French. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's beautiful. And I do want to give you the opportunity to just, um, if there's any other projects you've got going on, but let us know some of the cool, nerdy things that are going on in projects that. Anything else you want to finish the show with today? I mean, the biggest thing that I'm working on is the 10th anniversary edition of the Dictionary Demons, which will be coming out next year, uh, which lets me put, when I wrote it, I I cut like 40,000 words out of the the final manuscripts to make it like fit. So I get to put all of that back in and then some, um, and I get to like really bring out uh, the fact that I've got a degree in this stuff. Uh, So we're going to take some deep dives into the Book of Enoch and the Dead Sea Scrolls and sort of like the roots of our modern idea of demonology and possession and where that comes from. Of course, we're working with Jack Osborne and Katrina Weidman on Portals to Hell. I know for sure that there's a season two. Uh, Travel Channel seems to have some interest in me for some other stuff, but I don't have solid answers for what that will ultimately mean. Uh, I do know that it meant that I got to do Travel Channel Haunted Salem Live, which was kind of fun. And I mean, beyond that, just writing, doing classes at Inspiration House, continuing to try to build Inspiration House into uh, a place where I can do not just retreats, but also just let people come out themselves, spend a couple of days there and get to know the spirits as well as I know them. Thank you for being you. You are fun to follow. Thank you so much for seeing me. Like it, like I said, in school, I was not the cool kid. I was the weird kid. And then I realized that that was my strength and my power. Like I was, I was never going to be not the weird kid. I'm, I'm six foot one. I'm intersex. I'm, I'm like, I came out of the box pretty weird. I don't fit any mold and I'm fine with that. And I think the, the best thing about that is all of the people who eventually reach out and the ones who I know never do because they are afraid to. 
who just say, in seeing you live your life, I have more strength to live mine. You rock. Thank you, Michelle. That was fun. Thank you to the following super parrot nerds who support the show at patreon.com slash big seance. Anne Marie Sullivan, Justin J. Justin, Liz is my muse, Genesis, Natalie, Sonia B, Kim Robb, Jim Budd, Josiel Lorenzo, Susan Davey, Paula Mitchell, and Amy Park Gedicke. My supporters at the parlor guest level who can be found at bigseance.com slash parlor guests are Linda of shimmeringmoons.com, Denise Sia of Mystic Moms Paranormal, Anne Rekovich of ozparatech.com, Peggy Hagen, Diane Rax, James Wilfong, Glenna Becker, Nettie, Joni Kuntz, Dina DeCastro of Dina DeCastro Astrology, Sharon B., Marion Hover, Clairvoyant, Bruce Williams, Christopher Kohler, Lena and John of CarbonLilies.com, Anna Frias, and Norman and Linda Keller. That sound you just heard was the above and beyond there's not even a category for your level of support fireworks display. Because this week, I have four awesome listeners who support the show at the $10 level. Steve Skinner, Jackie Pacheco, Kevin Gilbert, and AJ Meredith. So thank you, Jackie, Steve, Kevin, and AJ. And thank you, Paranerds. For show notes, including links to anything we may have mentioned in this episode, visit BigSeance.com. You can find and subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, and just about anywhere podcasts are found. Do you have any comments or feedback? Go to BigSeance.com slash feedback to learn how to get your voice in a future show. Or you can call my feedback line, 7755-TELL-ME. That's 775-583-5563. Interested in learning how to promote and share the podcast? Go to bigseance.com slash share. Thank you so much for listening. Unfortunately, it's time to blow the candles out. But we'll see you and light them again next time. (laughs) 